would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Harry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leashed in like hounds, should famine, sword and fire crouch for employment. <laughs> But pardon, gentles all, the flat and raised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold should bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France? Or may we cram within this wooden... Oh, the very cast that did affright the air at Agincourt. Oh, pardon. Since a crooked figure may attest in little place a million, and let us, Cyprus, to this great account on your imaginary forces work. Suppose within the girdle of these walls are now confined two mighty monarchies, whose high upreared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow ocean parts asunder. Peace out her uh, imperfections with your thoughts. Into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance. Think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hoofs in the receiving earth. It is your thoughts that now must take our kings, carry them here and there, jumping all the times, turning the accomplishment of many years into an hourglass. For the which supply, admit me, chorus to this history, who prologue like your Humble patience, pray, gently to hear, kindly to judge our play. My lord, I'll tell you, that self-bill is urge, which in the eleventh year of the last king's reign was like and had indeed against us past, but that the scambling and unquiet time did put it out of further question. But how, my lord, shall we resist it now? It must be thought on. If it pass against us, we lose the better half of our possession. For all the temporal lands which men to devout by testament have given to the church, would they strip from us, being valued thus as much as would maintain to the king's honor full 15 earls and 1,500 knights, 6,200 good esquires, 100 almshouses right well provided, and a thousand pounds by the year. Thus runs the bill. This would drink deep. It would drink the cup and all. But what prevention? The king is full of grace and fair regard. And a true lover of the holy church. The courses of his youth promised it not. The breath no sooner left his father's body, but that his wildness seemed to die in him too. Never was such a sudden scholar made. Never came reformation in a flood with such heady currents, scouring faults, nor never hydra-headed willfulness so soon did lose his seat and all at once as in this king. We are blessed in the change. He but reason in divinity and all wondering with an inward wish you would wish to see the, the king made a prelate. Hear him debate of commonwealth affairs and you would say it hath been all in all his study list his discourse of war, and you shall hear a fearsome battle rendered you in music. Turn him to any cause of policy. The Gordian knot of it he will unloose, as familiar as his garter, that when he speaks, the air, a chartered libertine, is still, and the, the mute wonder lurketh in men's ears to steal his sweet and honeyed sentences, that the art and practic part of life must be the mistress to this theory which is wonder how his grace hath gleaned it, since his addiction was to course his vein, his, his companies unlettered, rude, and shallow, his hours filled up with riots, banquets, sports, and never noted in him any studies, any retirement, any sequestration from open haunts of popularity. The strawberry grows underneath the nettle, and wholesome berries thrive and ripen best when neighbored by fruit of base equality. And so the prince obscured his contemplation under a veil of wildness, which no doubt grew like the summer grass, fastest by night. It must be so. For miracles are ceased, and therefore we needs must admit the means how things are perfected. 
But, my good lord, how now for mitigation of this bill, urged by the Commons? Doth his majesty incline to it or no? He seems indifferent, or rather, swaying more upon our part than cherishing the exhibitors against us. For I have made an offer to his majesty as touching France to give a greater sum than ever at one time the clergy yet did to his predecessors part withal. How did this offer seem received, my lord? With good acceptance of his majesty. Save there was not time enough to hear, as I perceived his grace would fain have done, the severals and unhidden passages of his true titles to certain dukedoms, and generally to the seat and crown of France, derived from Edward, his great-grandfather. What was the impediment that broke this off? The French ambassador upon that instant craved audience. And the hour, I think, is come to give him hearing. Is it four o'clock? It is. Then go we in to know his embassy. My learned lord, we pray you to proceed and justly and religiously unfold why the law salic that they have in France or should or should not bar us in our claim. And God forbid, my dear and faithful lord, that you should fashion, rest, or bow your reading. For God doth know how many now in health shall drop their blood in approbation of what your reverence shall incite us to. Therefore, take heed how you impawn our person, how you awake our sleeping sword of war. We charge you, in the name of God, take heed. For never two such kingdoms did contend without much fall of blood. Under this conjuration, speak, my lord, for we will hear, note, and believe in heart that what you speak is in your conscience washed as pure as sin with baptism. Then hear me, gracious sovereign, and you peers that owe yourselves your lives and services to this imperial throne. There is no bar to make against your highness claim to France but this, which they produce from Pharamon. In terum salicum, mulieres ne succedent. No woman shall succeed in salic land which Salic land the French unjustly glossed to be the realm of France, and Pharamond the founder of this law and female bar. Yet, their own authors faithfully affirm that the land Salic is in Germany, between the floods of Sala and of Elba, where Charles the Great, having subdued the Saxons, there left behind and settled certain French, who, holding in disdain the German women for some dishonest manners of their life, Establish then this law, to wit, no woman should be inheritrix in Salic land, which Salic, as I said, between Elba and Sala, is at this day in Germany, called Meissen. Then doth it well appear. The Salic law was not devised for the realm of France, nor did the French possess the Salic lands until 401 and 20 years after the defunction of King Pharamond, idly supposed the founder of this law. Besides, their writers say, King Pepin, that deposed Childeric, did as heir general, being descended of Blithild, which was daughter to King Clothair, make claim and title to the crown of France. Hugh Capet also, who deposed Charles, the Duke of Lorraine, sole heir male to the true line and stock of Charles the Great, to find his title with some shows of truth, though in pure truth it was corrupt and naught, conveyed himself as the heir to the Lady Lingard, daughter to Charlemagne, who was son to Louis the Emperor, and Louis, son to Charles the Great. Also, King Louis X, sole heir to the usurper Capet, could not rest quiet in his conscience wearing the crown of France, till satisfied that fair Queen Isabel, his grandmother, was lineal of the Lady Ermengar, daughter to Charles the said Duke of Lorraine, by the which marriage the line of Charles the Great was reunited to the crown of France. So that, as clear as is the summer's sun, King Pepin's title and Hugh Capet's claim, King Louis, his satisfaction, all appear to hold in right and title of the female. So do the kings of France unto this day. Howbeit, they would hold up this Salic law to bar your highness claiming from the female, and rather choose to hide them in a net than amply to embar their crooked titles used up from you and your progenitors. Well, may I with right and conscience make this claim? The sin upon my head, dread sovereign. For in the book of Numbers is it written, 
When the man dies, let the inheritance descend upon the daughter. Gracious Lord, stand for your own. Unwind your bloody flag. Look back to your mighty ancestors. Go, my dread Lord, to the tomb of your great grandsire from whom you claim. Invoke his warlike spirit and your great uncles, Edward the Black Prince, who on the French ground played a tragedy, making defeat upon the full power of France, whilst his most mighty father stood smiling to behold his lion's whelp forage in blood of French nobility. Awake, remembrance of these valiant dead, and with your puissant arm renew their feats. You are their heir, you sit upon their throne. The blood and courage that renowned them runs in your veins. <laughs> and my thrice puissant liege is in the very May morn of his youth, ripe for exploits and mighty enterprises. Your brother kings and monarchs of the earth do all expect that you should rouse yourself, as did the former lions of your blood. They know your grace hath cause and means and might. So hath your highness. Never king of England had nobles richer and more loyal subjects whose hearts have left their bodies here in England and lie pavilioned in the fields of France. Oh, let their bodies follow, my dear liege, with blood and sword and fire to win your right. In aid whereof, we of the spiritualty will raise your highness such a mighty sum as never at one time the clergy did yet bring into any of your ancestors. We must not only arm to invade the French, but lay down our proportions to defend against the Scot, who will make road upon us with all advantages. But there's a saying, very old and true, <laughs> if that you will, France, win, then with Scotland first begin. <laughs> For once the eagle England being in prey, to her unguarded nest, the weasel Scot comes and so sucks her princely eggs, playing the mouse in absence of the cat to tame and havoc all that she can eat. It follows then that the cat must stay at home. And that is but a crushed necessity. Since we have locks to safeguard necessaries and pretty traps to catch the petty thieves. While at the armoured hand doth fight abroad, the advised head defends itself at home. For government, though high and low and lower, put into parts, doth keep in one consent, congreeing in a full and natural close, like music. Therefore doth heaven divide the state of man in diverse functions, setting endeavor in continual motion, to which is fixed as an aim or but obedience. For so work the honeybees, creatures that by a rule in nature teach the act of order to a peopled kingdom. They have a king and officers of sorts, where some, like magistrates, correct at home. Others, like merchants, venture trade abroad. Others, like soldiers, armored in their stings, make boot upon the summer's velvet buds, which pillage they with merry march bring home to the tent royal of their emperor, who Busied in his majesty, surveys the singing masons building roofs of gold, the civil citizens kneading up the honey, uh, the poor mechanic porters crowding in their heavy burdens at his narrow gate, the sad-eyed justice with his surly hum, delivering o'er to executors pale the lazy, yawning drone. I this infer that many things, having reference to one consent, may work contrariously. As many arrows loose in several ways come to one mark, as many ways meet in one town, as many fresh streams meet in one salt sea, as many lines come to the dial center, so may a thousand actions once afoot end in one purpose and be all well born without defeat. Therefore, to France, my liege, Divide your happy England into four, whereof you shall take a quarter into France, and you with all shall make all Gallia shake. If we, with thrice such powers left at home, cannot defend our own doors against the dog, let us be worried, and our na nation lose the name of hardiness and policy. Call in the messages sent from the Dauphin. 
Now are we well resolved, and by God's help and yours, the noble sinews of our power, France being ours, will bend it to our oar, or break it all to pieces. Now are we well prepared to know the pleasure of our fair cousin Dauphin, for we hear your greeting is from him, not the king. May it please your majesty to give us leave freely to render what we have in charge, or shall we sparingly show you far off the Dauphin's meaning and our embassy? We are no tyrant, but a Christian king. Therefore, with frank and with uncurbed plainness, tell us the Dauphin's mind. Thus then, in few. Your Highness, lately sending into France, did claim some certain dukedoms in the right of your great predecessor, King Edward III. In answer of which claim, the Prince, our master, says that you savour too much of your youth, and bids you be advised there's naught in France that can be with a nimble galliard one. You cannot revel into dukedoms there. He therefore sends you, meter for your spirits, this ton of treasure. And, in lieu of this, desires you let the dukedoms that you claim hear no more of you. This the Dauphin speaks. What treasures, uncle? Tennis balls, my liege. <laughs> we are glad the Dauphin is so pleasant with us. For his present and your pains, we thank you for. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we will in France, by God's grace, play a set shall strike his father's crown into the hazard. Tell him he hath made a match with such a wrangler that all the courts of France shall be disturbed with chases. And we understand him well. How he comes o'er us with our wilder days. We're not measuring what use we made of them. Oh, we never valued this poor seat of England. And therefore, living hence, did give ourselves to barbarous license, as tis ever common that men are merriest when they are from home. But tell the Dauphin I will keep my state. Be like a king and show my sail of greatness when I do rouse me in my throne of France. For that, I have laid by my majesty and plodded like a man for working days, but I will rise there with so full a glory that I will dazzle all the eyes of France. Yea, strike the Dauphin blind to look on us. And tell the pleasant prince, this mock of his, hath turned his balls to gunstones. And his soul shall stand sore charged for the wasteful vengeance that shall fly with them. For many a thousand widows shall this his mock, mock out of their dear husbands, mock mothers from their sons, mock castles down. And some are yet ungotten and unborn that shall have cause to curse the Dauphin's scorn. But this lies all within the will of God, to whom I do appeal. And in whose name tell you the Dauphin I am coming on, to venge me as I may, and to put forth my rightful hand in a well-hallowed cause. So get you hence in peace, and tell the Dauphin his jest will save a but of shallow wit when thousands weep more than did laugh at it. Convey them with safe conduct. Fare you well. This was a merry message. We hope to make the sender blush at it. Therefore, my lords, omit no happy hour that may give furtherance to our expedition, for we now have no thought in us but France. Now all the youth of England are on fire, and silken dalliance in the wardrobe lies. Now thrive the armourers, and honest thought reigns solely in the breast of every man. They sell the pasture now to buy the horse, following the mirror of old Christian kings with winged heels as English mercuries. For now sits expectation in the air and hides a sword from Helpsum to the point with crowns imperial. Crowns and coronets promised to Harry and his followers. Well, Matt, Corporal Nim. Ah, uh, good morrow, Lieutenant Bartolf. Oh, uh, hey, uh, what? Uh. Are our 
crunch and pizzle and you friends yet. Ah, uh, for my part I care not. I say little, but when time shall serve there shall be smiles. Well that shall be as it may. I dare not fight, but I will wink and hold out mine iron. It is a simple one, but what though? It will toast cheese and it will endure cold as another man's sword will. And there's an end. The French. That is the certain of it. Yeah. <laughs> I will bestow a breakfast to make you friends, and then we'll be all three sworn brothers to France. Let it be so, good Corporal Men. Faith, I will live so long as I may, that is the certain of it. And when I cannot live any longer, I will do as I may. That is my rest, that is the rendezvous of it. It is certain, Corporal, that he is married to Nell quickly. And certainly did you wrong, for you were troth plight. I cannot tell. Things must be as they may. Men may sleep, and they may have their throats about them at that time, and some say knives have edges. <laughs> <laughs> it must be as it may. Though patience be a tired man, yet she will <laughs> Here comes Andrew Pizzle and his wife. Now, good corporal, be patient here. How now, mine host, Pizzle? Base tyke, call thou me host. My body stand, I swear, I scorn the term. Nor does Marnell keep lodging. No, by my troth, not long. For I could not board and lodge a dozen or forty gentle women that live honestly by the prick. And their needles. But we thought we'd keep a gaudy ass straight. Oh, well, a day, lady. If she not be drawn now, we'll see willful adultery and murder committed. <laughs> good lieutenant, good corporal, offer nothing here. Pish! Pish for thee, thou Iceland dog, thou pricky and cur of Iceland. <laughs> Good corporal name. Show thy valour and put up thy soul. Will you shut up? I would have you soulless. Soulless? Egregious dog. Oh, viper vile. The soulless in thy most marvellous face. The soulless in thy teeth and in thy throat and in thy hateful lungs. Yeah, and in thy more purdy and witches were within thy nasty mouth. Far do retort the solace in thy bowels, for I can take, and pistol's cock is up, and <laughs> flashing fire will follow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And doting death is near, therefore exhale. Oh. <laughs> hear me, hear me what I say. He that strikes the next stroke, I'll run him up to the hills, as I am a soldier. An oath of mickle might, and fury shall abate. Uh, give me thy hand, thy forefoot to be give. Thy spirit is most tall. I'll cut thy throat one time or other in fair terms. That is the humour of it. A coupel, eh, eh, gorge. That is the word. I defy thee. I have, and I will hold, the quondam quickly. And the only she. And porker. Oh. There's enough for two. <laughs> my old pistol, you must come to my master. And you, hostess, he is very sick and would to bed. Good bottle. Put thy face between his sheets and do the office of a warming pan. Oh, Faith, he's very ill. Go away, oh. you rogue. By my trough, he'll yield the crow and put him one of these days. The king has killed his heart. Good husband, come out presently. Come, come. Shall I make you two friends? Huh? We must to France together. 
Why the devil should we keep knives to cut one another's throats? As floods are as well and fiends for food, hold on. You'll pay me the eight shillings I would have your betting. <laughs> Base is a slave that pays. That's now all have, that is the humour of it. And manhood shall compound. Push out. Come by this sword. <laughs> by this sword. He that makes the next thrust, I'll kill him. By this sword I will. A sword is an oath. Ah. An oath must have their course. Corporal Mim, and thou will be friends, be friends, and thou will not. Why then be enemies with me too? Prithee put up. A noble shout thou have, and present pay, and liquor likewise will I give to thee, and friendship shall combine, and brotherhood. I'll live by Nim, and Nim will live by me. Is that not just? Throw Sattler be into the camp, and profits will accrue. So give me thy hand. I shall have my noble. In cash most justly pay. Well then, that's the humour of. As ever, you come a woman. You're coming quickly to Sir John. Oh, poor art. He's so shaped of a burning quotidian you intuition that it's most lamentable to be old. Sweet men, come to him. The king hath run bad humours on the night. That's the even of it. Nin, that speaker right. His art is fractured and corroborate. The king is a good king. But it must be as it may. He passes some humours in careers. Let us condole the night, for lambkins we will live. French advised by good intelligence of this most dreadful preparation, shake in their fear, and with pale policy seek to divert the English purposes. Oh, England, model to thy inward greatness, like little body with a mighty heart, what mightst thou do? That honour would thee do, were all thy children kind and natural, but see thy fault France hath in thee found out. A nest of hollow bosoms which he fills with treacherous crowns and three corrupted men. One, Richard, Earl of Cambridge. And the second, Henry, Lord Scroop of Massam. And the third, Sir Thomas Grey, Knight of Northumberland. How for the guilt of France, oh, guilt indeed. Confirm conspiracy with fearful France and by their hands his grace of kings must die. If Helen treason hold their promises, ere he take ship for France and in Southampton. Linger your patience on and we'll digest the abuse of distance. Force a play, the sum is paid, the traitors are agreed, the king is set from London, and the scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. There is the playhouse now, there you must sit, and thence to France shall we convey you safe. And bring you back again. Charming the narrow seas to give you gentle pass, for if we may, we'll not offend one stomach with our play. But till the king come forth, and not till then, out of Southampton do we shift our scene. For God, his grace is bold to trust these traitors. They shall be apprehended by and by. How smooth and even they do bear themselves, as if allegiance in their bosom sat, crowned with faith and constant loyalty. The king hath note of all that they intend by interception which they dream not of. Nay, but the man that was his bedfellow, whom he hath dulled and cloyed with gracious favours, that he should for a foreign purse so sell his sovereign's life to death and treachery. Now sits the wind fair, and we will aboard. <laughs> my lord of Cambridge, and my kind lord of Massum, and you, my gentle knight, give me your thoughts. Think you not the powers we bear with us will cut their passage through the force of France? No doubt, my liege, if each man do his best. Oh, I doubt not that, since we are well persuaded we carry not a heart with us from hence that grows not in a fair consent with ours, nor leave one behind that doth not wish success and conquest to attend on us. Never was monarch better loved and feared than is your majesty. There's not, I think, a subject that sits in heart, grief, and uneasiness under the sweet shade of your government. True. Those who were your father's enemies have steeped their galls in honey and serve you with heart created of duty and of zeal. Oh, we have great cause of thankfulness and shall forget the office of our hand 
Sooner than the quittance of desert and merit, according to the weight and worthiness. <laughs> so service shall, with steel in sinews toil, and labour shall refresh itself with hope to do your grace incessant services. We judge no less. Uncle of Exeter, <clears throat> enlarge the man committed yesterday that railed against our person. We consider it was excess of wine that set him on, <laughs> and on his more advice we pardon him. <sighs> That's mercy, but too much security. Let him be punished, sovereign, lest example breed by his sufferance more of such a kind. Oh, let us yet be merciful. Ooh. So may your highness, and yet punish too. Sir, you show much mercy if you give him life after the taste of much correction. Alas, your too much love and care of me are heavy orisons against this poor wretch. If little faults proceeding on distemper shall not be winked at, how shall we stretch our eye when capital crimes Chewed, swallowed, and digested appear before us. Hmm? We'll yet enlarge that man. Though Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray, in their dear care and tender preservation of our person, would have him punished. And now to our French causes. Who are the late commissioners? I won, my lord. Your highness bade me ask for it today. So did you mean, my liege? And I, my royal sovereign. Then, Richard Earl of Cambridge, there is yours. There yours, Lord Scroop of Massam. Sir Knight Grey of Northumberland, the same is yours. Read them, and know I know your worthiness. My Lord of Westmoreland and Uncle Exeter, we will aboard tonight. Why, how now, gentlemen? What see you in those papers that you lose so much complexion? Oh, look ye, how they change. Their cheeks are paper. Why? What read you there that have so cowarded and chased your blood out of appearance? I do confess my fault, and do submit to your highness's mercy. To, to which we all appeal. appeal. The mercy that was quick in us, but late by your own counsel, is suppressed and killed. You must not dare for shame to talk of mercy, for your own reasons turn into your bosoms as dogs upon their masters worrying you. Well, see you, my princes and my noble peers, these English monsters. My lord of Cambridge here, you know how apt our love was to accord, to furnish him with all appurtenance belonging to his honour. And this man hath, for a few light crowns, lightly conspired and sworn unto the practices of France to kill us here in Hampton. To the which this night, no less for bounty bound to us than Cambridge is, hath likewise sworn. But oh, what shall I say to thee, Lord Scroop? Thou cruel, ingrateful, savage, and inhuman creature! Thou that didst bear the key of all my counsels, that knewest the very bottom of my soul, that almost might have coined me into gold, wouldst thou have practised on me for thy use? May it be possible that foreign hire could out of thee extract one spark of evil that might annoy my finger. Oh, how hast thou, with jealousy, infected the sweetness of affiance? Will show men dutiful? Why, so didst thou. Will seem they grave and learned? Why, so didst thou. Come they of noble family? Why, so didst thou. Well, seem they religious? Why, so didst thou! Or are they spare in diet, free from gross passions, or of mirth or anger, constant in spirit, not swerving with the blood, garnished and decked in modest compliment, not working with the eye without the ear, and but in perjured judgment, trusting neither? Such and so finely bolted didst thou seem that thus thy fall hath left a kind of blot to mark the full fraught man and best endued with some suspicion. I will weep for thee, for this revolt of thine methinks is like another fall of man. Their faults are open, arrest them to the answer of the law, and God acquit them of their practices. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Richard, Earl of Cambridge. I arrest thee of high treason by the name of Henry, Lord Scroop of Massam. I arrest thee of high treason 
by the name of Thomas Gray, Knight of Northumberland. Our purposes God justly hath discovered, and I repent my faults more than my death, which I beseech your highness to forgive, although my body pay the price of it. For me, the gold of France did not seduce, although I did admit it as a motive the sooner to effect what I intended. But God be thanked for prevention, which I in sufferance will heartily rejoice, beseeching God in you to pardon me. Never did loyal subject more rejoice at the discovery of most dangerous treason than I at this hour. Joy o'er myself prevented from this damned enterprise. My fault, but not my body. Pardon, sovereign. God quit you in his mercy. Hear your sentence. You have conspired against our royal person, joined with an enemy proclaimed, and from his coffers received the golden earnest of our death, wherein you would have sold your king to slaughter. His princes and his peers to servitude, his subjects to oppression and contempt, and his whole kingdom into desolation. Touching our person, seek we no revenge. But we our kingdom's safety must so tender, whose ruin you have sought, that to her laws we do deliver you. We'll get you therefore hence, poor, miserable wretches, to your death. The taste whereof, God of his mercy, give you patience to endure, and true repentance of all your dear offences. Bear them hence! Now, lords, for France, we doubt not of a fair and lucky war, since God so graciously hath brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way to hinder our beginnings. Then forth, dear countrymen, the signs of war advance. No king of England, if not king of France. No. Come on, man, the art doth yearn. Adolf, be blind. Nim, rouse those four in veins. Boy, bristle up thy courage. For full staff, he is dead. And we must earn, therefore. Or would I were with him, wheresomever he is, either in heaven or in hell. Nay, sure. He's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom. If ever a man went to Arthur's bosom, a man had a finer end and went away had he been any Christendom child. I parted in just between twelve and one. He at the turning of the tide. For after I saw him fumble with the sheets and play with flowers and smile upon his fingers' ends, I knew there was just but one way. His nose, it was as sharp as a pen on a table of green fields. And now, Sir John, quoth I, what man, be a good cheer. And I cried out, God, 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 three or four times. Now, uh, to comfort him, I bid he should not think of God, for I hoped there was no need to trouble himself with such thoughts yet. So he bade me lay more clothes on his feet, put my hand into the bed and I felt them and they were as cold as any stone. I felt to his knees and up peered and upward and all was as cold as any stone. The say cried out a sack. Aye, that I did. And of women? Nay, that I did not. Yes, that I did and said they were devils incarnate. He could not abide carnation. It was a colour he never liked. I said once the devil would have him about women. I did in some sort, indeed, and or women. But then he was rheumatic and he talked to the aura Babylon. Do you not remember? I saw a flea stick upon Bardolph's nose and I said it was a black soul burning in hell. <laughs> well, the fuel is gone, I maintain that fire. That's all the riches I got in his service. Shall we shog? The king will be gone from Southampton. Come, that's the way. 
My love, give me thy lips. Look to my chattels and my movables. Let senses rule. The world is pitch and play. Trust none. For oaths are straws, men's faiths are wafer cakes, and old fast is the only dog. My duck, therefore, Caveto be thy counsellor. <laughs> Go, clear thy crystals. <clears throat> Yoke fellows in arms, let us to France. Like horse leeches, my boys, to suck, to suck. The very blood to suck! And that's but an wholesome food, they say. Touch her soft mouth and march. <laughs> Farewell, hostess. Let us with her appear. Old fast are they command. Farewell. Adieu. Oh. Come on. Comes the English with full power upon us, and more than carefully it does concerns to answer royally in our defences. Therefore, the Dukes of Bourbon, of Rombre, and Orleans shall make forth, and you, Prince Dauphin, with all swift dispatch, to line and new repair our towns of war with men of courage and with fears dependent. For England, his approaches makes us fierce as waters to the sucking of a gulf. It fits us then to be as provident as fear may teach us, out of late examples left by the fatal and neglected English upon our fields. My most redoubted father, it is most meet we arm us against the foe, for peace itself should not so dull a kingdom, though war nor no known quarrel were in question, but the defences, musters, and preparations should be maintained, assembled, and collected as though a war were in expectation. Therefore, I say, tis meet we all go forth to view these sick and feeble parts of France, and let us do it with no show of fear, no with no more than if we heard, oh, England were busied with a, a, a witch some modest darts. For my liege, she is so idly kinged, her scepter so fantastically borne by a vain, giddy, shallow, humorous youth that fears attend her not. Oh, peace, Prince Dauphin. You are too much mistaken in this king. Question, your grace, with what great state he heard our embassy. How well supplied with noble counsellors, how modest in exception, and withal how terrible in constant resolution. And you shall find his vanities forspent, were but the outside of the Roman Brutus, covering discretion with a coat of folly, as gardeners do with ordure, hide those roots that shall first spring and be most delicate. Well, tis not so, my Lord High Constable, but though we think it so, it is no matter. In cases of defence, tis best to weigh the enemy more mighty than he seems. So the proportions of defence are filled, hmm? Which of a weak and niggardly projection doth like a miser spoil his coat with scanting a little cloth? Think us, King Harry, strong. And princes, look you strongly armed to meet him. The kindred of him hath been fleshed upon us, and he is bred out of that bloody strain that haunted us in our familiar paths. Witness our too much memorable shame when Cresci battle fatally was struck, and all our princes captive by the hand of that black name, Edward, Black Prince of Wales. Whiles, at his mountain sire, on mountain standing up in the air, crowned with the golden sun, saw his heroical seed, and smiled to see him mangle the force of nature, and deface the patterns that by God and by French fathers had twenty years been made. This is a stem of that victorious stock, and let us fear the native mightiness and fate of him. 
Ambassadors from Harry, King of England, do crave admittance to your majesty. Who will give them present audience? Go and bring them. You see, this chase is hotly followed, friends. Well, turn head and stop pursuit. The coward dogs most spend their mouths on what they seem to threaten runs far before them. The good my liege, take up the English short and show them of what a monarchy you are the head. Self-love, my liege, is not so vile a sin as self-neglecting. From our brother of England? From him. And thus he greets your majesty. He wills you, in the name of God Almighty, that you divest yourself and lay apart the borrowed glories that by gift of heaven, by law of nature and of nations, longs to him and to his heirs, namely the crown and all wide-stretched honours that pertain by custom and the ordinance of times unto the crown of France. That you may know, tis no sinister nor no awkward claim, picked from the wormholes of long-vanished days, nor from the dust of old oblivion raked. He sends you this most memorable line, in every branch, truly demonstrative, willing you overlook this pedigree. <coughs> and when you find him evenly derived from his most famed of famous ancestors, Edward III, he bids you then resign your crown and kingdom, indirectly held from him, the native and true challenger. Or else what follows? Bloody constraint. For if you hide the crown, even in your hearts, there will he rake for it. Therefore in fierce tempest is he coming, in thunder and in earthquake, like a Jove, that if requiring fail, he will compel, and bids you, in the bowels of the Lord, deliver up the crown, and to take mercy on the poor souls for whom this hungry war opens his vasty jaws. And on your head, turning the widow's tears, the orphan's cries, the dead men's blood, the pining maiden's groans. For husbands, fathers, and betrothed lovers that shall be swallowed in this controversy. This is his claim, his threatening, and my message. Unless the Dauphin be in presence here, to whom expressly I bring greeting to. For us, we will consider of this further. Tomorrow shall you bear our full intent back to our brother of England. <laughs> for the Dauphin, I stand here for him. What do you hear from England? Scorn and defiance, slight regard, Contempt, and anything that may not misbecome the mighty sender doth he prize you at. Thus says my king, and if your father's highness do not, in grant of all demands at large, sweeten the bitter mock you sent his majesty, he'll call you to so hot an answer of it that caves and woomy voltages of France shall chide your trespass and return your mock in second accent of his order. Say, if my father and the fair return, it is against my will, for I desire nothing but odds with England. And to that end, as matching to his vanity and youth, I did send him the Paris balls. He'll make your Paris Louvre shake for it. And be assured, You'll find a difference, as we, his subjects, have in wonder found between the promise of his greener days and these he masters now. Now he weighs time even to the utmost grain. That you shall read in your own losses, if he stay in France. Tomorrow shall you know our mind at full. Dispatch us with all speed. Lest that our king, 
come here himself to question our delay, for he is footed in this land already. You shall be soon dispatched with fair conditions. A knight is but small breath and little pause to answer matters of such consequence. Thus, with imagined wing, our swift scene flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose that you have seen the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty and his brave fleet with silken streamers, the young Phoebus fanning. Play with your fancies and in them behold upon the hempen tackle ship boys climbing. Hear the shrill whistle. Whistle which doth order give to sounds confused. Behold the thridden sails, borne with the invisible and creeping wind. Draw the huge bottoms through the furrowed sea, breasting the lofty surge. Oh, do but think you stand upon the rivage and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical, holding due course to half lure. Follow, follow. Grapple your minds to sternage of this navy and leave your England as dead midnight still, guarded with grandsires, babies and old women, either past or not arrived, to pith and puissance. For who is he whose chin is but enriched with one appearing here that will not follow these cold and choice-drawn cavaliers to France? Work! Work your thoughts and therein see a siege. Behold the ordnance on their carriages, with fatal mouths gaping on girded half lure. Suppose the ambassador from the French comes back, tells Harry that the king doth offer him Catherine, his daughter, and with her to dowry, some petty and unprofitable dukedoms. The offer likes not, and the nimble gunner with Linstock, now the devilish cannon, touches. And down goes all before them. Still be kind and eke out our performance with your mind. Ah! Ah! Once more! Ah! Unto the breach, dear friends, once more! Or close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews. Conjure up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard, favoured rage. To lend the eye a terrible aspect, and to pry through the portage of the head like the brass cannon. And the brow overwhelm it, as fearfully as doth a galled rock, overhang and jutting his confounded base, swilled with the wild and wasteful ocean. Now set the teeth, stretch the nostril wide, hold hard the breath, and bend up every spirit to his full height. On! On, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of war-proof. Fathers that, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morn till even fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonour not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you called fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeomen, whose limbs were made in England, Show us here the metal of your pasture, and let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. Oh, the game's afoot. Follow your spirit, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England, and St. George! Case of lives. <laughs> the humour of it is too hot, that is the very plain song of it. The plain song is most just, and humours do abound. Knock, now we come. God's vassals drop and die. In sword and shield, in bloody field, doth win immortal fame. Would I were in an alehouse in London? I'd give all my fame for a pot of ale and safety. <laughs> and I, and I, if wishes would prevail with me, my purpose would not fail with me. 
but thither would I hie. As truly, but not as truly, <laughs> as birds do sing or morph. Bow! Oh! Up to the breach, you dogs! Avant, you callions! Wait, him. Have mercy, great duke, to men of mould. Abate thy rage, abate thy manly rage, abate thy rage, great duke. Use lenity, sweet chuck. These be good humours. <laughs> ah! Oh, oh you're on a wing, Go, 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 go! As young as I am, I have observed these three swashers. I am boy to them all three, but all they three, though they would serve me, could not be man to me. For indeed, three such antics do not amount to a man. For Bardolf, he is white liverwood and red faced. By the means whereof, he faces it out, but fights not. The pistol, he have a killing tongue and a quiet sword. By the means whereof, breaks words and keeps whole weapons. For Nim, she have heard that men of few words are the best men, and so she scorns to say her prayers, lest she should be thought a coward. But her few bad words are matched with as few good deeds. For it never broke any man's head but her own. And that was against the post when she was drunk. They will steal anything and call it purchase. Bardolph stole a loot case, bore it twelve leagues, and sold it for three halfpence. Nim and Bardolph are sworn brothers in Vilchin, and in Calais they stole a fire shovel. I knew by that piece of service these men would carry coals. They would have me as familiar with men's pockets as their gloves or their handkerchiefs, which makes much against my manhood if I should take from another's pocket to put into mine, for it is plain pocketing up of wrongs. I must leave them and seek some better service. Their villainy goes against my weak stomach, and therefore, I must cast it up. Captain Fluellen! You must come presently to the mines. The Duke of Gloucester would speak with you. To the mines? Huh. Tell you the Duke, it is not so good to come to the mines, for look you, the mines is not according to the disciplines of the war. The concarbonate of it is not sufficient. For look you, the adversary has digged himself Four yard under the countermines. By Jesu, think you will blow up all if there is not better directions. The Duke of Gloucester, to whom the order of the siege is given, is altogether directed by an Irishman, a very valiant gentleman, i' faith. It is Captain McMorris, is it not? I think it be. By Jesu, he is an ass. I will verify as much as in his beard. He has no more directions in the true disciplines of the war, look you, of the Roman disciplines, than is a puppy dog. Ah, here he comes. And the Scots captain, Captain Jamie, ah, with him. Captain Jamie is a marvellous, valorous gentleman, that is certain. And of great expedition and knowledge of the ancient wars, upon my particular knowledge of his directions. By Jesu, he will maintain his argument as well as any military man in the world in the disciplines of the pristine wars of the Romans. I say good day, Captain ah, well. <laughs> Good end to you, worship. Good day, Captain James. How oh, now, Captain McMorris? Have you quit the mines? Are the pioneers given hour? By Christ, lad, tis ill done. The works gave over. The trumpets say in the retreat, and by my hand and my father's soul, I swear, oh, I would have blown up the time. So Christ save me, lad, in an hour. Oh, tis ill done. Tis ill done. By my hand, tis ill done. Captain McMorris, I beseech you now. Uh, will you vouchsafe me, look you? A, a few disputations with you? Partly concerning, touching upon the directions of the war, look you. As in the Roman wars, by way of argument, or friendly communication. Partly to satisfy my opinion, partly for the satisfaction, look you, of my mind. As touching the direction of the military discipline, that is the point. I love it, very good. Good say, good kind of. And I shall do you good in my baby again now, I shall. <laughs> my... Ah! 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 <laughs> it's no time to discourse. You can't say me. It is no time. The day is hot, and the weather, and the wars, and the kings, and the dukes. It is no time to discourse. The time is besieged, 
and a trumpet call us to the breach, and we talk, and be Christ do nothing. Shame for us all, it is shame to stand still, it is shame when his throat's to be cut. <laughs> By the mess, uh, these eyes of mine take themselves to slaughter. I'll do good service. Aye, or I'll look in the ground for it. Aye, or I'll go to death. I'll pay it as honestly as I may, that shall I surely do. And that is the breath and the long. But my, I've moved out to the field. Captain McMorris, I think, look you. Under your correction, there is not many of your nation. Of my nation? What is my nation? It's a villain and a bastard and a knave and a rascal. What is my nation? Who talks to my nation? Look, yo, if you take the matter otherwise than is meant, Captain McMorris, per adventure, shall I think you do not use me with that affability? As in discretion, you ought to use me, being a good man, as yourself, both in the disciplines of the war and in the derivation of my birth and other particularities. I do not know you so good a man as myself. So Christ save that. I'll cut off your head! Oh, gentlemen, both you shall mistake each other. I am level. The town sounds a parlay. Captain McMorris, where there is better opportunity required, I will be so bold to tell you that I know the disciplines of the war. And there is an end. How yet resolves the governor of the town? This is the latest parley we will admit. Therefore, to our best mercy give yourselves. Or like to men, proud of destruction, defy us to our worst. For as I am a soldier, a name that in my thoughts becomes me best. If I begin the battery once again, I shall not leave the half-achieved half-fleur till in her ashes she lie buried. The gates of mercy shall be all shut up. And the fleshed soldier, rough and hard of heart, in liberty of bloody hands, shall range with conscience, wide as hell, mowing like grass your fresh, fair virgins and your flowering infants. What is to me when you yourselves are cause, if your pure maidens fall into the hand of hot and forcing violation? What rain can hold licentious wickedness when down the hill he holds his fierce career, we may as bootless spend our vain command upon the enraged soldiers in their spoil as send precepts to the Leviathan to come ashore. Therefore, you men of Harfleur, take pity of your town and of your people. Whilst yet my soldiers are in my command, whilst yet the cool and temperate wind of grace o'erblows the filthy and contagious clouds of heady murder, spoil and villainy. If not, why, in a moment look to see the blind and bloody soldier with foul hand defile the locks of your shrill shrieking daughters, your fathers taken by the silver beards and their most reverend heads dashed to the walls, your naked infants spitted upon pikes whilst the mad mothers with their howls confused to break the clouds, as did the wives of jury at Herod's bloody hunting slaughtermen. What say you? Will you yield and this avoid, or guilty in defence be thus destroyed? Our expectation hath this day an end. The Dauphin, whom with succours we entreated, returns us that his powers are yet not ready to raise so great a siege. We therefore, great king, yield our town and lives to thy soft mercy. Enter our gates, dispose of us and ours, for we no longer are defensible. Open your gates! Come, Uncle Exeter. Go you and enter Harfleur. There remain and fortify it strongly against the French. Use mercy to them all. For us, dear uncle, Winter coming on and sickness growing upon our soldiers, we will retire to Calais. For tonight, in Harfleur, will we be your guest. Tomorrow for the march are we addressed.
Madame, il est fort bon anglais. Dites-moi l'anglais pour le bras. De arm, madame. Elle écoute. D'elbow. D'elbow. Mm. Je m'en fais la répétition de tous les mots que vous m'avez appris dès à présent. Il est trop difficile, madame, comme je pense. Excusez-moi, Alice. Écoutez. De hand, de fingers, de nails, de arm, de bilbo. Ah, d'elbow. Seigneur Dieu, je m'en oublie. Delbo. Comment appelez-vous le col? De neck, madame. De neck. Mm -hmm. Et le menton? De chin. De chin. Mm. Le col de neck. Le menton de chin. Oui, sauf votre honneur, en vérité, vous prononcez les mots aussi droits que les natifs d'Angleterre. Je n'ai du point d'apprendre par la grâce de Dieu. Et donc, n'avez-vous pas déjà oublié ce que je vous ai enseigné Non, je réciterai à vous promptement. De hand, de fingers, de nails. Ah, de nails, madame. De nails, de arms, de elbows. De elbows. Madame, elle count. Le foutre, chut, elle a coup. Non. Oh, oh, oh. Chut, chut, chut. oh, Seigneur Dieu, ce sont les mots de ce mauvais. Corruptible, gros et impudique, et non pour la dame dans la Oh mon Dieu. Je ne veux pas prononcer ces mots. C'est bon, le Seigneur de France, moi, tu l'as mort. Non. La faute, elle a coup. Chut, madame. Ni à moi, je réciterai pour notre foi ma leçon. Ensemble. <coughs> the hand, the fingers, the knives, the arm, the elbow, the neck, the skin, the foot, oh. and the cold. <laughs> Excellent, madame. <coughs> C'est assez pour un froid. Allons nous à dîner. Tis certain he has passed the river Somme. And if he be not fought with all, my lord, let us not live in France. Let us quit all and give our vineyard to a barbarous people. But you vivant, shall a few sprays of us, the emptying of our father's luxuries, our scions put into wild and savage stock, spirit up so suddenly into the clouds and overlook their grafters? Normans, but bastard Normans, Norman bastards, Mutamavi! If they march along and fought with all, but I will sell my dukedom to buy a slobbery and a dirty farm in that nook shot Nile of Albion. Dieu de bataille, where have they this metal? Is not their climate foggy, raw, and dull, on whom, as in despite the sun looks pale, killing their fruit with frowns? Can sodden water a drench for serene jades their barley broth decoct their cold blood to such valiant heat? And shall our quick blood, spirited with wines, seem frosty? 
For honour of our land, let us not live like roping icicles upon our houses thatch, whilst the more frosty people sweat drops of gallant youth in our rich fields. <laughs> oh, by faith and honour, our madams mock at us and plainly say they will give their bodies to the lust of the English youth, to new store France with bastard warriors. They bid us to the English dancing schools and teach the vultures high and swift colantos, saying our grease is only in our heels and that we are most lofty runaways. Where is Monjoy the herald? Speed him hence. Let him greet England with our sharp defiance. Up, princes, and with spirit of honour edged more sharper than your swords, hide to the field. Charles Delabre, High Constable of France, you Dukes of Bourbon, Rombre and Orleans, High Dukes, Great Princes, Barons, Lords, Knights, for your great seats now quit you of great shames. Bar Harry England that sweeps through our land with pennants painted in the blood of Harfleur, rush on his host, as doth the melted snow upon the valleys whose low vassal seat the Alps do spit and void his room upon. Go down upon him, you have power enough. And in a captive charity to Rouen, bring him our prisoner. This becomes the great. Sorry am I his numbers are so few, his soldiers sick and famished from their march. For I am sure that when he shall see our army, he shall drop his heart into the sink of fear, and for achievement offer us his ransom. Therefore, Lord Constable, haste on Monjoy. Let him say to England that we sent to know what willing ransom he will give. Prince Dauphin, you shall stay with us in Rowan. Not so, I do beseech your majesty. Be patient, for you shall remain with us. Now forth, Lord Constable, and princes all, and quickly bring me word of England's fall. How now, Captain Flewellyn? Come you from the bridge? I assure you there is very excellent services committed at the bridge. Is the Duke of Exeter safe? The Duke of Exeter is as magnanimous as Agamemnon. And a man who I honour and love with all my soul and my heart and my duty and my life and my living and my uttermost power. He is not, God be praised and blessed, any hurt in the world. But he keeps the bridge most valiantly and with excellent discipline. There is an ancient lieutenant there at the bridge who I think in my very conscience is as valiant a man as Mark Antony. And he is a man of no estimation in the world, but I did see him do his gallant service. What do you call him? He is called Ancient Pistol. I know him not. Oh, oh here is the man. Captain, of thee beseech thou do me favour. The Duke of Exeter loves thee well. Aye, I praise God, and I have merited some love at his hands. Bardolf, a soldier, sound and firm of art, of buxom valour, hath, by cruel fate, and giddy his fortune, furious fickle wheel, that goddess blind that stand upon the rolling restless stone. By your patience, ancient pistol, fortune is painted blind with a muffler afore her eyes to signify to you that fortune is blind. She's painted also with a wheel to signify to you, which is the moral of it, that she is turning an inconstant and variation and mutability, and her foot looks you rests upon a spherical stone which rolls and rolls and rolls. In good truth, the poet makes an excellent description of it. Fortune is an excellent moral. Fortune is Bardol's foe and frowns on him. For he hath stolen a pax, and hanged must he be a damned death. Well, let Gallo gape for dog, let man go free, let not hemp his windpipe suffocate. But Exeter hath given Doom of death for packs of little price. Therefore, go speak. The Duke will hear thy voice. Let not Bardolph's vital thread be cut by edge of pen and cord and vile reproach. Speak, Captain, for his life, and I will be requited. Ancient pistol, I do partly understand your meaning. Why then, rejoice therefore. <laughs> Certainly, ancient, it's not a thing to rejoice at. For 
If he were my brother, I would desire the Duke to use his good pleasure and put him to execution. <laughs> For discipline ought to be used. Die and be damned! A figure thy friendship! Ha! Tit is well! The figure spy! Oh, very good. Why? This is an arrant counterfeit rascal. I remember him now. A board, a cut purse! I assure you! He uttered his brave words at the bridge, as you shall see in the summer's day. But it is very well. What he has spoke to me. It is well. I warrant you. Why, it is a gull, a fool, a rogue who now and then goes to the wars to grace himself at his returning to London in the form of a soldier. And these fellows are perfect in the great commander's names and will learn you by rope where services were done. At such and such a sconce, at such a breach, at such a convoy. Who came off bravely, who was shot, who disgraced, what terms the enemy stood on. And this they con you perfectly in the phrase of war, tricked up with new tuned oaths. And what a beard of the generals cut, and a horrid suit of the camp will do amongst foaming bottles and ale washed wits is wonderful to be thought on. But you must learn to know these slanders of the age, or else you may be marvellously mistook. I tell you what, Captain Gower. I do perceive he is not the man. He would gladly show to the world he is. Huh. If I find an all in his coat, I will tell him my mind. Hark you, the king is coming. I must speak with him. God bless your majesty. How now, Flewellyn? Comes thou from the bridge? Aye, so please your majesty. The Duke of Exeter has very gallantly maintained the bridge. The French has gone off, look you. And there is most gallant and brave passages. Marry, <clears throat> the adversary was out possession of the bridge, hmm? but he is enforced to retire. <laughs> and the Duke of Exeter is master of the bridge. I tell you, Your Majesty, the Duke is a brave man. What men have you lost, Flewellyn? The perdition of the adversary is very great, reasonable great. Marry, for my part, I think the Duke hath lost but never a man. But one that is like to be executed for robbing a church. One Bardolph, if your majesty know the man, his face is all babookles and whelks and knobs <laughs> and flames of fire. And his lips blows in his nose and it's like a coal of fire. <sighs> sometimes blue, sometimes red. <laughs> but his nose is executed and his fire's out. We would have all such offenders so cut off. And we give express charge that in our marches through the country there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. You know me by my habit. Well then, I know thee, what shall I know of thee? My master's mind. Unfold it. Thus says my king, say thou to Harry of England, though we seemed dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. Tell him we could have rebuked him at half fleur, but that we thought not good to bruise an injury till it were full ripe. Now we speak upon our cue, and our voice is imperial. England shall repent his folly, see his weakness, and admire our sufferance. Bid him, therefore, consider of his ransom, which must proportion the losses we have borne, the subjects we have lost, the disgrace we have digested, which in wait to re-answer his pettiness would bow under. For our losses his exchequer is too poor. For the effusion of our blood, the muster of his kingdom, to faint a number. And for our disgrace, his own person kneeling at our feet. But a weak and worthless satisfaction. To this add defiance, and tell him for conclusion he hath betrayed his followers, whose condemnation is pronounced. So far, my king and master, so much my office. What is thy name? I know thy quality. Montoy. Mm. Thou dost thy office fairly. Turn thee back and tell thy king I do not seek him now, but could be willing to march on to Calais without impeachment. For, to say the sooth, though it is no wisdom to confess so much unto an enemy of craft and vantage, 
My people are with sickness much enfeebled, my numbers lessened, and those few I have almost no better than so many French, who, when they were in health, I tell thee, Herald, I thought upon one pair of English legs did march three Frenchmen. Yet, forgive me, God, that I do brag thus. This your heir of France hath blown that vice in me. I must repent. Go, therefore, and tell thy master, here I am. My ransom is this frail and worthless trunk. My army, but a weak and sickly guard. Yet, God before, tell him we will come on. Though France himself and such another neighbor stand in our way. Well, there's for thy labor, Montjoy. Go bid thy master well advise himself. If we may pass, we will. If we be hindered, we shall your tawny ground with your red blood discolor. And so, Montjoy, fare you well. The sum of all our answer is but this. We would not seek a battle as we are, nor as we are we say we will not shun it. So tell your master. I shall deliver so. Thanks to your highness. I hope they will not come upon us now. We are in God's hand, uncle, not theirs. March to the bridge. It now draws toward night. Beyond the river, we'll encamp ourselves, and on tomorrow, bid them march away. 